My life has changed dramatically since the accident. As of right now, there's nothing to cure paralysis, um, besides maybe a miracle. The first thing I'd do if I get my arms back, I would hug my daughter. Be really nice to scoop something up on a spoon and feed myself again. This is gonna go beyond spinal cord if this works. This is gonna go MS. This is gonna go stroke. This is huge. This is millions and millions and millions of people. I'm pretty much broken from the neck down, I guess you could say. The only thing that I have left that is untouched is my brain. And uh, obviously I'm able to use it very good. I'm able to do this and do that. Um, you know, no memory loss, no nothing. So I opted for an experimental surgery to go at the one thing that I still have. What we try to do is uh, put a, a, a grid in place that's capable of recording signals from the brain. So when you think, when you think I want to move, there's actually electrical impulses in the brain. We want to be able to record those electrical impulses and then decode what, what the electrical impulses mean and use that to control an object or an arm. People have thought for a long time that we might be able to tap into the brain, but it's only recently that we've gotten closer and closer. Uh, there's some great work going on here at the University of Pittsburgh by a, a gentleman named Andy Schwartz. And Andy has shown that he can get a monkey to control a robotic arm with an amazing degree of freedom by thought. So we've developed technology where we can implant an array of electrodes, microelectrodes, in the cerebral cortex of monkeys. And we can record activity from many neurons in the brain simultaneously. And from that signal, we can extract the monkey's intention to move its arm. And now that we have that, we can have intercept that signal and use it, instead of moving the monkey's own arm, to use it to move a prosthetic arm. Just two weeks. Yeah. I think he said it actually. What it takes to really get into people is a, is a large team. So we've basically been somewhat isolated in our laboratory, working on monkeys, proving the technology, just making discoveries, validating the technology, developing new ways of doing this. And what we've been able to do recently is pass a lot of this knowledge that we've gained to clinical um, colleagues. They came to the laboratory, learned a lot of what we're doing, and then took it back to the clinic and developed the technology that's appropriate for humans. We were implanting our first uh, patient in a clinical trial to place self dural grids or electrodes on the surface of the brain uh, in an attempt to use them as a brain computer interface for the ultimate goal of controlling a prosthetic arm. And we'll start out simply with trying to do some cursor control hoping that over the 28 days that he's implanted that we will be able to progress to potentially being able to control a robotic arm. Two days after the surgery, um, we plugged me in and started to basically train my brain, train the computer to my brain the way I'm thinking. The computer doesn't know up, down, left, right, it just knows the signals that I'm thinking. For the first couple days it was just, what's up, what's down? Uh, how I do it is I look at the ball, at the top and through my peripheral vision I see the ball that's moving so I'm, I'm focusing on the target and almost with my peripheral if I want to go up I'm with my mental eyes or whatever you want to call it lifting up trying to get that ball to go up or trying to get it to go down so I'm focusing on the target while watching the moving ball with my peripheral it's like a one-player video game I'm trying to beat my own score because there is a score you know there's a certain percentage it's out of six, you know, each time I do it, it's out of 16 um, balls, if you want to say. And uh, I want to know that number. If it's 13, I want the 14, or I want the 15. And um, so it's just a challenge to myself. One thing I found out that if I focus too hard, it doesn't work right. It has to be very natural. That's pretty good. Yeah, not too bad. We're making such ground on this every single day. Um, every other day, we're just going leaps and bounds and knowing that we're doing that if I had another week or two weeks or month where would we be then um, we'd be I mean we've already done stuff that's unprecedented you know I've been I've been doing stuff I've been told um, that with the 3d curse control people have been doing it for a year two years um, that they haven't got the type of control and percentages that I've gotten um, in a day literally a day The highlight was 45 minutes ago. Uh, I got to use a robotic arm for the first time, and uh, 
I got to reach out and touch somebody for the first time in seven years. Baby. <laughs> yeah, I'm reaching out and touching my girlfriend for the first time and holding her, holding her hand. That was. That was my highlight. You, you really did start to sense that, for instance, his girlfriend um, had taken this as an embodied hand of Tim's and was actually feeling it, the extension of Tim's body scheme to that hand. But what we really want to do and what we think of in terms of the way we act on the environment is we're generating behavioral output. So the only way you can express yourself, what's going on in your mind, what you're thinking about, is by moving. And what we want to do when we give these immobilized patients this um, device is we want to enable them to express what's going on. We want them to be able to output their behavior into the real world. For this research to move forward right now, what we need is a number of different things. We need great scientists. The team that we had working on this experiment, the multidisciplinary team of neurosurgeons, engineers, neurologists, occupational therapists all working together, that needs to continue and I'm sure we can continue that. We need funding. We've been fortunate. We've received funding from the National Institutes of Health, from the VA, from the Department of Defense, uh, and from UPMC, all of which is critical to this going forward. And we need participants like Tim. Uh, we need people who are willing to step forward and say, I understand that I have a role and I can uh, push the science forward. Uh, it, it's not going to help them tomorrow, but it could help them a few years down the road. All right. There you go. All right. All right. All right. Nice. <laughs> I believe in my heart that this is the future. And anybody out there who has the courage and the want to try to do this, you, you got to go for it. And hopefully it'll help you just as much as it, I believe it's going to help me.